Welcome everybody to this small video presentation. My name is Andreas Meyer and I'm the first time here on ISMRM. But to be honest, it's also the first time that ISMRM seems to be happening right here in my office. Still, it's a great pleasure to give this invited presentation and it's entitled Lessons from Other Imaging Modalities. So I would like to start with a small introduction. Then I want to present to you the state of the art in computer tomography because this is the main field where I work on. And in the end, I want to present a bit about future work. So I'm from the Pattern Recognition Lab of the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg, Germany. We have like two professors, one lecturer, two postdocs, quite a few PhD students, and we have more than 10 work groups running right now. So the main areas of our work is biomedical image and data processing. We do some computer vision, some speech recognition, and lately also some digital humanities. Well, being located in Erlangen, you can imagine that we work with quite a few imaging modalities. So I have quite a few interesting things that I would like to show to you today. So the topic are lessons from other modalities and you asked me to present the lessons from medical image reconstruction from all the other modalities in 30 minutes. So let's see whether I will be able to do that. And to be honest, when I was preparing this presentation, I can tell you I won't be able to show you the entire state of the art within 30 minutes. But what I can tell you is that there is fabulous special issues around, like the one here in TMI. And there's a series of very interesting workshops going on, looking into machine learning and its combination with image reconstruction. So we also have been hosting workshops lately in 2018 on Mikai and also in 2019. And I think if you look into these workshop proceedings, you will find a lot of the things that I'm presenting to you today. So definitely have a look at those and of course at the other workshops that have been organized lately. So I would like to focus on the state of the art in computer tomography mostly in this presentation. And I would like to share the observations that I did in this field with you here in this presentation. Well, the state of the art lately is, of course, deep learning. And deep learning comes in several flavors. So you could say there's the pure data-driven approaches, there are trainable classical approaches, and mixed approaches. So I think this is the main outline of the presentation that I want to show to you today. And now we will look into the different variants here. First and foremost, if you talk about pure data-driven approaches, I would like to mention AutoMap. So AutoMap is a quite visible approach because it essentially claims that it is able to solve any kind of reconstruction problem in any kind of modality and it's shown for MR and PET imaging. There are other approaches that are also quite common in this direction and one that is quite common in CT is essentially image-based reconstruction. So here the idea is that you start with an reconstructed, partially reconstructed image and then you try to complete it with a data-driven method. And here I show an approach that is based on unit to complete the reconstruction process. Well, let's have a look into those approaches. And if you look at this idea of showing a partial image and then reconstructing it with unit, you may say, this sounds impossible, right? But to be honest, if you work with these approaches, and here we show an example of a limited angle reconstruction where we only measured 120 degrees on the left-hand side image, and on the right-hand side, you can see how the full image would look like. So if we try to do that, it's quite amazing that we get images like this one. So you can see that the image is correctly reconstructed. We can also see that the chest wall here is appearing again. So the large artifact is gone. We see the heart, we see the lungs, rib cage, and spine. So everything seems to be present in the image. To be honest, I think we should look into this in more detail and not just look at a single image. So we actually conducted a study where we tried to 
see how robust these approaches are, and you can find all the results here in reference 4. So one of the experiments, we tried to hide a lesion in this area here, and we created a blow-up view down here in the image, such that you can see all of the details. Now, if we take this and perform a limited angle reconstruction, we get the following image. You can see that our lesion is supposed to be located here. It kind of is here, but it sits in the midst of artifact. So let's see whether it can be completed. And I can tell you, yes, the lesion is still there. So those pure data different approaches kind of work. Now, this is a very good result, but to be honest, this algorithm has never seen noise. And if I add only a slight bit of noise to the projection data before reconstructing the image, I get the following result. So you can see here that not just the lesion is gone, but the chest wall is moving by approximately one centimeter. So one could argue, well, noise is a kind of adversarial attack to this kind of network. So to be honest, if we train the network also with the Poisson noise, then we can actually fix this problem and we still get the lesion reconstructed. But in contrast to the previous image, it's not as sharp as it used to be and it's largely blurred. Remember, all of the things that we're doing here are local optimization strategies and the results of the training process produces a local optimal algorithm. So in one of the local minima, we found also reconstructions like these here. So this is now a window level that is focusing on the air beside the patient. And you can see that in this type of reconstruction, we see organ-like shapes emerging beside the image. So you see here, this looks maybe like a kidney or maybe this is a liver. And this is kind of a result that is unexpected. And maybe we want to do something about this and find approaches that are more robust to unseen data. This brings us to the second type of approach, and these are trainable classical approaches. So here, one thing that I would like to show is deep learning computer tomography. This is a paper from 2016 on Mikai, where we essentially looked into a trainable version of the filter back projection algorithm. There's also much more elaborate approaches that you also know from MR, like the variational networks that map essentially an entire iterative reconstruction into a trainable network. Of course, this also works for CT, as shown in reference number seven. And there is even more advanced approaches where entire primal dual reconstructions can be mapped into deep networks. Of course, I'm omitting many, many references here. There is many ideas around these trainable classical approaches. And again, I have to refer to the special issue and workshop papers. What I would like to highlight in the following is one idea why generally the combination of classical approaches and deep learning might be beneficial. So we have some results where we looked into the idea of including prior operators in neural networks because maybe we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Let's go back to the very theory of universal approximation and consider what is actually happening when we try to approximate something with a network. The universal approximation theorem tells us that if we try to approximate a true function u of x with an approximation capital U of x, we can define an approximation with the following equation. So this is essentially a linear combination using weights ui of some nonlinear functions that have a mapping of a high dimensional hyperplane onto a signed distance. This nonlinearity is typically a sigmoid function in new versions, also the rectified linear unit. And for this type of configuration of neural network, there is an error bound epsilon u that gives us the maximum distance between capital U of x and u of x. And by the way, what we have here in this equation is nothing else than a one hidden layer neural network. So any continuous function on a compact set, and remember the compact set, 
that is essentially the training data set, can be approximated with such a one hidden layer neural network. The main disadvantage of this approach is that if you want to have your epsilon to be very small, you need to go to very high numbers with the number of nodes in this hidden layer. Well, this is interesting, but actually we would be interested in exploring like deep networks where we have operators U, G, F that could be different sampling or projection operators and then make these things trainable and combine those with deep learning techniques. Now we've already seen that this is difficult, but let's at least look at two layer networks. And here we postulate that our true function f of x, so maybe our reconstruction operator, is composed of two different functions. And this is essentially u of x, which is a vector to vector mapping, and g of x, which is a vector to scalar mapping. Now, if we look into those kind of networks, we can see that we can find different approximations. Well, we could approximate u. That would give us the first line here. So f u of x would be g of capital U of x, and that introduces some error e u. We could also approximate g. This gives us then f g of x, and this introduces an error e g. And obviously, we can approximate both of those layers, and if we approximate both, we end up with e f. I want to spare you going through all of the math, but it can be shown that the error EF has an upper bound that is essentially dependent on the errors EU and EG. And the nice thing here is that the error of U of X and G of X, they're additive. Meaning that if I know one of the two, this additive term essentially cancels out because the epsilon here is going to be zero if I know G of X. And this means that the more knowledge I incorporate into the network, the smaller the error bound is. Also interesting about the error in u of x is that it's amplified with the coefficients of the approximator gj and also the ls is the Lipschitz constant of the function. But all of those are positive values, which means that if the error euj is zero, the entire term here will cancel out. So this is interesting. The error is additive. The error of u of x is amplified by g of x. And if you map this to classical pattern recognition theory, you will notice that the vector to vector transform u of x could be a feature extractor and g of x a classifier, which also relates to the classical importance of features in pattern recognition and machine learning. Note that we require Lipschitz continuity in all of these considerations. Of course, this only applies to two-layer networks. Well, there's good news. We can also extend it to deep networks, and then we can really explore combinations like these. And if you want to do that, then essentially you see that all of these errors and the respective Lipschitz constants, they again form a sum. And if you know the function in the respective layer, the error of this layer cancels out, which then shrinks our upper bound. So if you're interested in this proof by recursion, you can find it in this paper in Nature Machine Intelligence. Well, now let's go to our example of computer tomography. We know the solution of computer tomography already since 1917. This is Radon's classical inversion formula. It's a convolution along S and then a back projection along theta. So if we look at this in more data, we see this is all linear operators and that also can be modeled as the matrix inversion of our projection operator A and then we get essentially A transpose, that is the back projection. And because of Radon's solution, we know that this inverse here takes the form of a filter. So this is simply a circulant matrix. And now we have already all the ingredients to map this into a network. So the resulting network would then be simply a filter layer, a back projection layer, and then we add a non-negativity constraint because it can't be that anything inside the patient is actually emitting radiation. Also interesting is there's nothing that we actually need to train here because we know all of the configurations from the solution to the filtered back projection process. 
One thing that is noteworthy is that this back projection operator in a 3D problem can be really big and it's also very sparse. So one idea in order to make this trainable is that you fix the geometry because this operator only incorporates geometry and then you can use efficient projection and back projection implementations on the graphics card to make the remaining network trainable. Well, of course, the solution that I've just shown to you is only valid for parallel beam geometries, but if we add this additional weight matrix W here, we can also process fan beam and even cone beam reconstruction formulas. Now we have more than three layers, so we essentially have a deep network here, right? I can show you some results. This is a full reconstruction with 360 degrees, and if I only reduce it to 180 degrees. Note that the full scan here would only comprise 200 degrees. So we are essentially missing only 20 degrees of angular range. But we already get this large amount of artifact. Of course our filter back projection formula is not suited for limited angle reconstruction, but if we train it then we can demonstrate that we can reduce the artifact quite considerably. So if you see the difference between the two here, you see that our trained neural network reconstruction already is performing a lot better than the previous solution. So if you look at the image in more detail, you can see that there are still some artifacts that are present in the image, but the image content is already much improved. The interesting thing about the solution is that you can now look at the learned weights and if you look at the solutions, we start with the idea by Parker, where he is essentially downweighting rays that have been collected twice to form exactly a sum of one on the opposite direction. And this is a solution that is known since 1982. In the solution that we found with our neural network, you see that it's essentially preserving the previous shape by the Parker weights, but it's increasing the weight in this area and in this area. And only one year later, colleagues from Philips actually suggested to increase the weights here because these are the areas in the sinogram where too few rays are measured. So you essentially create a flipped version of the Parker weights that then upweight the missing rays in these areas. This is a complete heuristic and doesn't have any theoretical foundations, but we see that it works better. If we look at the result of a neural network, we can say this is at least a data optimal weighting and you see that this shape is very similar to what has been identified by Schäfer and colleagues. Now, of course, there's further extensions and you already know if you're familiar with variational networks that any kind of energy minimization problem can be mapped into an unrolled feed forward network. So here we add an additional compressed sensing inspired de-streaking approach on top of our neural network reconstruction and this enforces the sparsity in an unknown domain and the unknown domain Ki is essentially what we want to learn here and now we can compute the gradient with respect to the energy minimization above and do a fixed number of iterations and this then gives us the following network. So here we have our neural network reconstruction that is essentially the trainable filtered back projection. And then we add on top the gradient steps here that is following the variational network approach. And of course, this is then able to learn the sparsifying transform that is then optimal with respect to our application. And here are some results. You can see that our neural network reconstruction still suffers from streaks if we have a very close window level. And we can also see that traditional denoising approaches are not able to reduce those streaks. But if you look at the variational network, it performs very nicely and reduces those streaks because it is able to find a transform that is describing those streaks in a non-sparse way and this then gets reduced over the number of iterations. Well, what else? There are the mixed approaches. There are like mixed reconstruction approaches that introduce essentially deep learning ideas. 
and then mix them with data consistency steps. There's very nice work by Haltmeier and here uh, Kofler, which is the unit cascading, but there's many, many more papers in this direction. There are artifact reduction networks like for motion, metal, and many more things like scatter and beam hardening. We have exemplarily here reference number 12. And there are also things that consider geometric reformation, like training, trajectories, and things like that. And you see all of these things are, of course, also emerging right now in the MR community. So I brought here reference number 13, which is essentially a learned rebinning approach. And again, I can just point you to the respective special issues and workshops where many, many more good papers are being presented. Well, let's look into this reference 13. And the main question that we've been asking here is, can we derive networks? And let's say you have an application where you can acquire comb beam data. So comb beam data has this source here, and you are acquiring this projective kind of information from the object. And now the main problem with this projection imaging is that if you have something here in the object or here in the object, the magnification will be different. Let's say you're working in orthopedics. You would be interested in measuring, let's say, a crack in the bone here directly on the projection image. But if you want to do that, you actually need a parallel projection. But a parallel projection is something that we typically can't measure in CT. So we can measure several comb beam projections in a row, but the rebinning to parallel is typically something that causes significant resolution loss. Well, what can be done? Well, the thing that links those two equations is, of course, the object. But I don't want to have a full reconstruction. Still, I can manipulate the equation and solve the comb beam projection for the object. Now that I know the object, I can plug it in to my parallel beam equation. And now you can see that I essentially found an expression that helps me to get from comb beam data to parallel beam data. Now, one thing that is not so great is that we have this inefficient matrix inverse here. We know from CT reconstruction theory and from Radon's observation that quite often these kind of operations take the form of a filtering. So let's replace it with a Fourier transform, a diagonal matrix K, and an inverse Fourier transform. Now I know everything in this set of operations except for my matrix K, and this essentially gives us a new network topology where we then have some comb beam data and some matching parallel beam data. And this allows us to determine this matrix K. And note that, of course, we could also embed other nonlinear formulas that could be approximated as long as I'm able to compute a gradient or at least a subgradient of the problem. Well, let's see how this performs. And I brought a small video where we actually looked into a generalization of this. We are looking into rebinning. And here we are back to the MR community. So we are interested in a hybrid system here. We are acquiring in K space radial spokes that would be parallel projection images. And now we are interested in creating a transform directly onto comb beam projection images. So we can formulate the problem in the same way as we just did. This brings us to an unknown filter. And we want to estimate this filter that we see here on the left-hand side using a learning approach. Here in the center, you see actually the true object in blue. You see the difference between the true object and what our filter is currently producing in green and the filter output here in orange. And we are training this entire setup only using geometric primitives like spheres, cylinders, and planes, and some noise. Now that we do that, we immediately apply the learned filter onto an anthropomorphic phantom. And now the cool thing is, what you will see over the iterations, that we limit essentially the number of trainable parameters that much that we have the nice generalization capability, as shown here on the right-hand side, the unseen 
rebend MR projection. In the beginning of the training process, of course, this doesn't have a very good image quality. But now if we go ahead over the iterations, you see the filter forming and the image on the right getting much, much better projection image data. So here we see we get a crisp and sharp image. Obviously, I can also do this with projection dependent filtering. Then I get an array of filters. I can use the same idea. And again, you can see here on the right hand side how the image quality over the iteration improves. So this is a very nice approach in order to actually be able to describe this geometric rebinning approach in terms of filters and convolutions. We also observe that there is this large degree of generalization because we fix so many parameters in the network. This already brings me to the end of this presentation. And I think, as I already announced in the beginning, it's impossible to summarize in 30 minutes. There's many, many interesting approaches emerging. We see that the power of deep learning comes from the task dependency. So if you train a deep learning method, then you also buy in a task dependency. But within that task domain, you may be able to produce superior results. But of course, you have to be very careful with the generalization capability of the trained model. The approach, of course, is general, but the resulting model will be, of course, task dependent and has to be evaluated as such. And we see that this assumption of the compact set can kill us very quickly. For example, if I observe already some noise that has not been seen in the training data. So this is very crucial. There's more pitfalls in the paper that I referred to earlier. So I really can recommend looking into this reference. Also interesting is that all of the classical and the deep learning approaches are inherently compatible. So you can mix and match them. And if you already know something about your problem, then please integrate it into your network architecture. As I've just shown, there is theoretical evidence that the inclusion of such knowledge helps you with the maximum error bounds in your problem. And we could show in a couple of applications that we then also get much, much better generalization ability. So I think this is definitely interesting to look further into those combination of deep learning and classical approaches. I recommend to use the best of both worlds. And also keep in mind that Another key feature that we can learn from the world of deep learning is this end-to-end -end learning that allows the optimization of all steps simultaneously. Also something that will be very important for the future of all kinds of image reconstruction approaches. And it also allows us to couple the image reconstruction with the subsequent analysis, which is something that I haven't talked about at all here, but this is also a big emerging topic that you create specialized reconstructions with respect to a specific imaging or image analysis purpose. Well, of course, I'm not just doing this all alone. There's corporations worldwide that we are dealing together with. And the nice thing being a computer science lab is that we work a lot with open source software. Many of the things that I've shown in this presentation, you can download the sources and also rerun this experiments. And of course, I have a lot of references here for you. The nice thing about a video presentation is, of course, that you can take all the time you need to read through those references. So all that remains is to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them, for example, on social media or also by email. And by the way, a lot of what you've seen in this presentation here is already part of an overview paper that you can find on Archive here. So thanks again and looking forward to receiving your questions. <laughs>